Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome, welcome. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, with thanks to the Knight Foundation for their generous support. Just a reminder to our internet audience, if at any time during the presentation tonight you'd like to order a copy of tonight's book, you can call the number on your screen below. And we'll get your copy signed and we'll send it to you free of charge for the shipping anywhere here in the United States. Uh, for those of you that are here, please silence your cell phones and uh, don't forget to visit our Books and Books website. Uh, it'll give you more information about all the upcoming events we have at Books and Books. We do about 60 every month, sometimes four a night. Uh, we have Spanish events, we have kids events, we have poetry readings, first-time authors, and celebrity signings. And when you visit our site, please don't forget to give us your email address so we can apprise you of everything that goes on here so you don't miss a thing. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. And last but not least, don't forget to visit our newest location in the uh, historic Sears Tower downtown at the Adrian Arch Center. We have a full bar and a real nice cafe there and a bookstore as well. So when you're not here, go there. When you're not there, come here. We'd appreciate it. Lincoln Road, Bell Harbor, yeah. Arsh Center, yeah, that's right. Tonight we're very happy to have with us Jeff Seymour and the real life actor. There's a sense that permeates most acting classes which promotes the idea that acting is hard and you need to do a bunch of traditional steps if you're ever gonna get anywhere. The flame of this concept is kept lit for two reasons. One is tradition. Successful actors and teachers in our theatrical history supposedly believe or and espouse such ideas or two that it's easier for teachers and actors to follow a path that is well-worn. Think of where we'd be in science or medicine or sports if no one questioned past methods or tried to discover new ones. This book will show you an approach that is direct and to the point, an approach that will be easier to remember and utilize. If you're an actor, this book will restore your sanity, says Stephen Pressfield, the author of The War of Art and The Legend of Bagger Vance. Jeff Seymour has been an acting coach for 34 years. He began his career in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles and while working in television as an actor, he designed and built the new theater which went on to become one of LA's most awarded and respected theaters. He spent 11 years in Canada working in the film and television industry and starred in three different television series, including Jeff Limited, which he co-created and co-wrote. He's won the Canadian Emmy and has traveled through the United States as well as Australia, teaching his highly successful acting in the business seminars. Please give him a nice warm welcome. Please welcome Jeff Seymour. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being here. So um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about this uh, book, but uh, I guess primarily I'm going to talk to you about the uh, approach um, that I cover in the book and what the book is about. Uh, as uh, Steve mentioned, I've been an acting coach. Uh, this is actually my 35th year. I started quite young, obviously. <laughs> and. Uh, I, uh, early on, uh, when I was in theater school, um, I tried to read, and I say try, I, I, I made a good effort to read m most of the books that are out, uh, the ones that everyone turns to, uh, the, uh, the great teachers from the past, the Uta Hagens and Stella Adlers and, and uh, Sanford Meisners and whatnot. I, I always found them a little hard to read. Uh, I always put that on myself. I just figured, well, perhaps I was just a little dumb. Uh, I just didn't get it. it. It made my head kind of swell up when I read these things. I, I never felt like it released me as an artist. I, I felt a little more encumbered when I read these books. Um, I just didn't quite get it. And uh, I was always searching around for answers. I was always looking for something that would help me in my career as an actor. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, that happened to me. I think it uh, kind of set things in motion early in my life. Um, I have a fascination for cars, uh, old British cars from the 50s and 60s. Um, I've restored them, I've owned them, and uh, it's always been a thing of mine. One summer when I was uh, 17, uh, I was apprenticing with the quintessential English mechanic, a guy named Bill Crook. He was uh, a mechanics mechanic, and uh, I, I was, uh, it was joy every day I was there. I generally just watched him and cleaned up at the end of the day, and uh, everything I know about tools and cars I learned from this man. At the end of one day, uh, I noticed this uh, box uh, sitting over to the side, and it had tools sticking out of it. I, I could immediately see that these tools were handmade. They were fashioned from bits of tools, long, odd objects that made no sense to me. And so I asked Bill, I said, Bill, what is this? And I picked up a long screwdriver with a welded uh, wrench on the end that was bent at a funny angle. I mean, it wasn't made to look nice, but serviceable. 
He said, oh, that's, that's uh, for a 1972 Alfa Romeo. The book, meaning what they could charge you, uh, puts down that it's going to take 12 hours to swap the clutch in an Alfa Romeo. He said, the reason why it takes 12 hours is because you have to take the engine out. The reason why you have to take the engine out is because there's one bolt you can't get to. He said, I made that tool, and now I can do that job in three hours. And then every tool in there was for something else. I mean, these were literally tools sticking outside of a box. And what this man that I respected so much was saying to me as a 17-year-old was, kid, just because something's in a book and just because people do it that way doesn't mean that you can't come up with perhaps a better, more efficient way to do things. That stuck in my head. I didn't even think about that then. But I was always kind of a, you know, to the beat of a different drummer kind of guy to begin with. But that certainly cemented it for me. And from that point on, I think in every aspect of anything I did, I think the question in the back of my mind was always, yeah, but do we have to take the engine out to swap the clutch? So I'd always look at things differently. So naturally, when I was reading these books and I wasn't making great sense of them and they weren't seeming to unleash the artist in me, I went on my own way. And at an early age, right around 21, I seemed to have an epiphany. Now, I, I come from a family of teachers, so teaching was always in my DNA. My father was a teacher from 18 till basically when he died, when he was 96. So teaching was always in my household. Everything that ever happened in my house was framed as a lesson. It was just the way it was. So as soon as I graduated uh, school, I decided that I was going to teach. And uh, the people I graduated with, my friends, were kind enough to be my first guinea pigs. And so we met and my classes started. Right off the bat, I was interested in what worked the best. I was looking for an approach or something that would be most effective. And that's what started me on my journey. And shortly thereafter, I built and designed the theater that he mentioned, the new theater. And uh, that allowed me to have this incredible laboratory where I could go, I could direct the shows, I lived next door to the place, uh, and uh, I could be at every performance, I could see everything that was going on. So I directed and produced all the shows, I designed and built the sets. I was kind of a one-man band, but I certainly learned a lot. And I did this for 10 years and directed all the shows there. And this was my laboratory. Now, I lived on this. This theater is how I made my living. So the shows had to do well. If the shows didn't do well, if they didn't get great reviews, if the classes I was teaching weren't full, well, then I theoretically would starve. You know, when you use someone else's methods, you don't have to, or approaches, um, you don't have to pay royalties. So I was happy to do whatever worked. I've always said the smartest idea in the room wins. When I'm collaborating with other artists, that's always the way it is. Let's just go with the smartest idea. So I had five classes a week, and I was directing all these shows. And, uh, well, not only was it important that my classes did well, that the actors uh, uh, got better in the classes, they improved, but of course my shows uh, had to do well. I had to get great reviews in LA, kind of the entertainment mecca of the United States and um, in the LA Times. And I had to find a way to speak to actors. I had to come up with some sort of a approach, a way of working that would work when actors were live. It's one thing to trick an actor into a great performance, film it, take it off, edit it, put it together, you've got it, it's in the can, he can go home, she can go home, you've got what you need. It's another thing to concoct a way of working where every night these people are going to be able to come up with something that no matter what night the LA Times or whatever the other papers were, the big ones that are going to decide my fate essentially as far as box office and my income goes, it's another thing to get those people to always be on their mark. That was a tricky part. What can I tell actors that will program them in a way that'll keep the work beautiful every night because I can't have it be, oh, you should have been here last night, I'm sorry the time's here tonight, or whoever, or my audiences, or all those people that I'm trying to please and trying to make a business out of what I'm doing. So I paid rapt attention. I watched my actors. Every so often as the uh, theater grew, I certainly got wonderful actors, uh, actors that worked all the time, and I paid attention to the way everyone worked. 
What did people do? What was their way into their work? What seemed to work the best? And as I said, I had this laboratory so I could watch every night. I could listen to uh, the uh, uh, people that watched the show. I could listen to them in the uh, lobby. I could hear what they said, whether they knew I was listening or not. And I could certainly read the reviews. What I found was that most of what was taught traditionally in theater, theater schools, isn't really what people who work all the time do. In fact, at all. At all. I mean, if I asked an actor whose work I liked, or I could watch it because I was, I was directing them, I'd kind of got an idea of their process, but certainly if they spoke, if I spoke to them, it became clear to me that most of the methods that most actors are taught in schools are never really used, that I ever saw in my 36 years now as an actor, in the professional world. I, I, I didn't see that. I, I, I didn't have people come off and say, hey, what's going on, or hear them talk about uh, one of these traditional methods that are always taught in schools. These teachers that we revere, and should, because of course I have nothing but respect for these wonderful, wonderful people um, who were quite popular back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s of the last century. But I can't help but feel that like everything else, um, you know, we move on. And um, ideas develop, and perhaps we always don't need to pull the engine out to swap a clutch. So. I came to realize that an easy way to explain this, an easy way to prove my point, would be to just use logic and common sense. That's all I ever do. And tonight I'm going to tell you these things, and I'm not going to ask you to believe me because I've been there and I know for sure, I swear it's true. I'm just going to hit you with logic, just complete logic. First of all, let's decide what great acting is. We should at least get on the same page, make sure we're talking about the same thing. I'll answer because, of course, I'm on a roll right now. Um, I think that uh, great acting to me is when I'm kind of unaware that I'm watching an actor acting. I get so caught up in the authenticity of what they're doing that I forget for a moment, and even though I'm in the business and I'm constantly reminding myself because I usually adore great performances and I'm, you know, uh, perhaps a little different than just a civilian would respond. I remind myself every so often, my goodness, that's an actor. Yet for that moment in time, of course, I'm just totally drawn into what they're doing. Whatever it is they say they are, I believe. It, they seem to blur that line between acting and real life. I mean, I think we could all agree, right? That's why we cry so hard at the end when so-and-so dies. So-and-so was just on David Letterman last night. We know they're not dead. But they're so convincing in their portrayal they're so real, they're so authentic that we get caught up and sometimes an entire movie goes by and we can't believe how fast it went by. I think they're great actors kind of in retrospect. I, I think about what they did and of course I realized being in the business that there was film crews, they were on stage, whatever the situation. And wow, that was amazing they did that because I thought what they did was so authentic, so real just took me, grabbed me. I, I, I was in, uh, under their power. I just, there was nothing I could do about it. Authenticity. I think uh, you actors that are here, you would probably agree that that's what you're trying to do. You certainly don't want people to be watching your work and constantly being reminded that you're acting. You would like to be as believable as let's say you are right now. And so to that end, let's take a look at this. If someone were filming me right now, and they actually are. And I were me, and I actually am, and you were you, and in fact you are. And you were doing what you're doing right now, listening to me give this lecture, and I'm doing this. Honestly, I can't do this any better than I'm doing it. Maybe that's sad for some of you, but it's true. This is the best I do, me. This is me in my shoes, feeling very connected with what I'm talking about, I feel very clear about the things I'm going to discuss tonight. I'm very present. And by the same token, you uh, people, if we were filming you and a camera were dollying along, starting our movie, the guy's giving a lecture, we're watching actors, 
listening to the lecture. You guys are perfect. I mean, you're really perfect. You couldn't do this any better. Even those of you that maybe aren't actors, I got to tell you right now, you got a future because you're brilliant. You look just like real people listening to me. Now, do you understand how, without any additional information, this is the beginning of our movie, I'm me, you're you. Do you understand you can't do this any better than you're doing it? You could do it differently. You could have on different clothes. We could light you differently. But honestly, it would be hard for you to be more authentic than you are right now. So I have a question for you. What are you thinking about? I know you're not thinking about any kind of acting exercise. You might be thinking about acting because we're talking about acting. But what I'm talking about are any traditional acting exercises. You're not playing anything right now. You're sitting there listening to me. And your mind may wander. You may think, oh, I should have eaten before I came. How long is this guy going to talk? You might be thinking about whether or not you put change in your meter outside. But that's what people do. So you're authentically listening to me here. You're just here. So my first question is, how have you arrived at this magnificent work that you're doing right now? Now, if somebody said, cut, and this was your gig for the day, and then they paid you some dough, that would be a pretty good job. That'd be good work when you could get it. And would you be taking the money for something you didn't earn? No, on the contrary. I would be thrilled to death with your performances if you were being you in this situation right now. You nailed it. I'm only thinking about what I'm speaking of. I'm only thinking about the things that a guy like me would be thinking about right now. That's what I'm thinking about. That's what keeps me so focused. You do your best work in real life. Any actor. Any actor. Any person. You do your best work in real life. That's a fact. In fact, I tell actors all the time, I'd have no problem getting the best of what you are. You, when you're at your finest. You, when you're at your scariest, your most romantic, your most funny, you know, your most whatever. You are, when you are absolutely at the top of your game in any of these situations, I could get you to bring that to your work. What I can't do is make you any more magnificent than you are. That's something you're going to work on your whole life. And I tell actors you should. Which means don't just keep thinking about acting your whole life. Have a hobby. Go travel. Learn things. Be a more interesting person. You'll have more to bring to the table. But my point is, you can't get any better than this. So I keep coming back to this question. What do you really think about in these situations? You know, I, I coach actors for auditions. And I do my best to get them in the right frame of mind, not just what they're going to be doing in the room, but getting them to be in the right frame of mind so they can get in there and be with all these people and not get thrown and not be too nervous and not have detrimental nerves that are going to derail them and take them off the mark. This is what I spent a lot of my time doing. And what I always hear about is how they got distracted, how something happened, how they saw the producer's face turn slightly and look away and seem like they were talking to someone and that distracted them. Or, or the person seemed to fiddle with their phone for a second and they were thrown and then they blamed their bad audition on this moment where they were distracted. And then I asked that same person and I'll ask you all the same thing. Have you ever been in a situation in life where you were having a discussion with someone? Maybe an argument, maybe if something was very important to you? Are you so easily distracted? Does a piece of paper fall off the counter and then you look over and then you need to take something back? Isn't it amazing how you can be in an argument in real life and maybe, you know, sadly going at each other, full throttle. And there's a knock at the door. A Girl Scout's there. You answer the door. You're very nice to the Girl Scout. You're a smart, civilized person. She had nothing to do with your lousy husband. You even buy some cookies. You bring the cookies back in, throw them on the counter, and you pick up that scene exactly where you stopped at full throttle. I mean at the same volume. There's no need to take it back to where, you know, uh, uh, right before I threw the plate and called you a lousy bastard. You don't have to do that. You don't take anything back in life. You pick it up right then and you go. Look at the focus we have in real life. 
I mean, come on. I, 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 most people are like bulldogs when it comes to making a point. When you guys are after something, when you want something in life, when you have a bone to pick with someone, when you're making an argument with someone, how easily are you distracted? I'm sure that most of you pride yourself on your ability to get the thing done and get to it. And I went and I told him and he tried to tell me that and I told him this. You know, the car doesn't backfire. You don't go, oh, where was I? Can we take it again? I'm fascinated by these kinds of questions because that tells me that something's wrong with traditional methods. Something is amiss. Because most actors I know are way funnier and more fascinating than when I watch them act. And I've watched over 10,000 auditions in my career. 10,000. I've watched them. I've sat in a room and had 10,000 actors come through. That's a lot of people to watch. You learn a lot from that. And it always fascinates me at how actors uh, are not nearly as interesting, as funny, as clear as they are in life. So I've looked at this now for 35 years. And for 20 years, I wanted to write that book. And I started many different times. And then finally, this past year, I sat down to do it. And I decided it was time. Not only that, but Stephen Pressfield, who I adore as a writer, um, and is a friend of mine and the only real writing mentor I've ever had. Uh, we were sitting at breakfast, and I was telling him a story about uh, having worked on Homeland, and uh, just an anecdote. And he said, Jeff, you've got to write your book. And I felt like, you know, Sensei had said to me, write your book. So I went off, and, and I wrote it. I used him as the excuse. I knew it had to get done. These are all my findings in that book. So here's what I know. Let's look at the history for a second of acting. We don't really know what people did exactly until we started filming, right? Because otherwise it's hearsay. We can't really see it. What I mean is up until film was developed and we started making silent pictures, we could only go on hearsay. People said different things about different performances through time, but, you know, it's hard to say. It's subjective. Would it have been as realistic as it is today? I think so. I think from the very beginning, people would probably just default to being realistic. We're actually portraying people. There might have been people right out of the box that just had that ability. But then we had silent films, and a funny thing happened. Acting really had to change, because obviously in theater, you can speak. So when people were giving theater productions, they didn't have to do anything extra. What did you have to do extra? Well, if there's no speaking, the, ch the acting style is going to have to change a bit, right? So when you're scared, you've got to be scared. And when you're the bad guy, you've got to twirl your mustache. And everything has to be big and that because, you know, and the guys have to wear black that are bad and the good guys wear white. And, you know, we have to be incredibly clear because we're watching a silent film. But then the talkies came. Well, I think with the talkies came, it didn't just make everybody all of a sudden go into hyper-realism. I think that they started speaking, but then there was a... Still, if you go back, I bring up the example of, uh, for instance, the African Queen, which I believe got 12 Oscar nominations with, of course, Kate Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart. If you look at it by today's standards, I don't think that you would think anything other than there's a lot of mugging by today's standards. It's a different style of acting. You'd have guys walk in and go, hello, darling. You know, I, I don't know if that's how they spoke. Uh, I wasn't around then, but, you know, there's a jaunty thing and people kept themselves open like they're on stage. And, but then things started to change, you know, in the 40s and 50s when we had the group theater and, of course, Lee Strasberg and, uh, and Clifford Odets and uh, certain writers and groups, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater, there were people that were starting to say, look, you know, realism is realism. And what's going to move you are real people doing real things. And so suddenly there was this movement, certainly with uh, uh, Montgomery Cliff and James Dean and, of course, Marlon Brando. You know, all of a sudden people are stopping and saying, oh, hold on a second. And, and there was a real need to kind of break acting down. 
So there were these questions, there were these ways of looking at things, you know, now, now, so they had exercises, you know, private moments, sit in a chair, taste the hot coffee, you just have a glass, there's water in it, and feel the heat, feel the sun, and there was this breaking down of these very simple things because there was a need to, because people needed to put the brakes on and say, stop. What is a real impulse? What is reality now? Because we had a slightly stylized way of acting. But then the 50s came, the 60s came. We had, of course, the Dustin Hoffmans and, and John Voights, and we had all the great directors and uh, uh, Scorsese and Robert Altman. And as we get into the 70s and 80s and 90s, I think that you could all agree that what we're into now is like a hyperrealism. I mean, there's no question about it anymore. What we seem to love most is when, man, oh man, you look at that film and you think that's the real deal. There's no question about it anymore. There's not, there's not even a talk of style. There's no style. There's no style. In fact, a lot of these films are done improv and, you know, with the uh, a cinema verte kind of thing, bang, bang, realism and rough and, you know, sometimes nothing very pretty about it. And we flocked to those performances. We love them so much. So what hit me was, in the 35 years I've been teaching, no one has come up with any real new ideas. And I, I think that's odd. As I looked at these old methods, I thought, you know, the problem I have with these old methods, which again are like really wonderful when they were made, just like a medical procedure might have been fantastic in the 20s last century or anything else that was great. A golf club, a wooden tennis racket, fantastic. The best wooden tennis racket in all the land. But you're not really going to be able to win any tournaments with it anymore. Things just change. Things get simpler. They get lighter. They turn into carbon fiber. They get smaller. There's less moving parts. And so I wondered why no one has come up with a cleaner, clearer way of acting. And so now I'm going to tell you the problem I have with what I feel are kind of antiquated methods. I've spent my whole career, most of the time, telling actors, you're thinking too much. You're in your head, man. You've you, you got way too many ideas going on in your head. It hit me that any approach that it is enough of an approach or a method that draws attention to itself to where the very thing that you're doing has its own machinery is cumbersome and unusable. You can't use it. Why? Well, I'm going to go back to what I told you. You're doing your best work right now, right? Now, imagine if you had some acting stuff you were doing. Like you knew you were going to speak and you've... Uh, you've underlined some of your action verbs, or you've decided in two lines coming up, you have, uh, you, uh, you have an action for each line. Maybe you're going to play an animal. Uh, uh, you've got uh, not only a, a, a primary objective, but you've worked out your secondary and tertiary objectives. If a human being did that, you would be being disingenuous in any conversation we were having because it wouldn't really be about our conversation, would it? It would be about our conversation and then a bunch of other stuff you've kind of worked out and you're thinking about and you're trying to play on me. Let's just break that down into human behavior. That's being disingenuous. I'm sorry, it is. There's no other way to look at it. Now, understand, I'm telling you this from having spent 35 years in the business. So I'm not just an acting teacher who has been teaching in a room. I have been in battle. I have been on all the sets. I have actually been there and had to make my living. And so what I'm talking about is what I see actually happens in the field. And in the field, I've yet to meet anyone who professes to use any of those old methods anymore. Now, again, I'm not here to put down those methods, but I have to make the distinction because, well, I was having a conversation recently with a fellow. I met him at a party, and he, and he found out I was this acting coach, and then he was familiar with my name. So he said, so what's your method? And I said, well, you know, it's kind of hard to just tell you right here over a beer, but um, that wasn't going to stop me, so I was going to do it anyway. But he quickly told me that he believed in one of these methods. 
I said to him, um, yeah, wow, I couldn't even get through that book. I couldn't. I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm not a stupid fellow, but it, I just couldn't get through it. I tried and I realized I'd gone five pages and then I realized I wasn't paying attention, so I'd go back and it just didn't work for me. I said, I don't believe in any of that stuff and I gave him a quick rundown. Now, here was a guy who initially puffed his chest up, said, this is what I believe in. This is what I do. And he was so proud because, in fact, his coach who taught that method was going to show up at the party. And as soon as I started talking about the fact that, you know, I don't believe in any of that stuff because I think that the best work and a blah, 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 kind of, you know, of course, a uh, reused digest version of what I've done so far, uh, in a split second, he turned around and said, you know what? I can't stand that method. I have hated it every second that I've done it. I can't tell you how many times this happens to me. And what does it tell me? It tells me that people are so afraid to say, I don't get it. It's not for me. I don't want to do a repeat exercise or whatever. Things that were brilliant, brilliant when they came out. But they were needed at a particular time. And I think that times have moved on. They just have. Now, listen, I can make my argument and I'll only hit you with logic and I'll make my argument 30 different ways. Here's another way I'll make it. I meet people, they tell me, oh, no, 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 no. I do this method, I do what uh, Hagen or, or Stella Adler, whatever, and I'm sold and I'm done and I, and I do it. And so I say, okay, great, that's great. What does it do for you? And they say, well, it, 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 it makes me uh, uh, better at my work. And I say, well, how, 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 in what sense better? What does that mean? He said, well, it, you know, I'm a, a better, I, I'm, I, I communicate. I'm, I'm, I said, so you're, you're stronger if you need to be or more scary, you're more scary. If it's, whatever the scene is needed, Man, it, it delivers it, right? You're scarier, you're more authentic, you're more uh, persuasive. Absolutely. That's what it does. So all that acting calculus that you do and all those notes you make and all those lists you do, they make you better. So you're, you're, you're more effective. Is that it? Absolutely. So my next question always is this. If that's the case, then in real life, when you're going to walk into a situation where maybe you either have to break up with your wife or get her not to leave you or get a raise or get not, you know, try not to get fired or get some extension on your end, something that's really important, and, and I'd have to say a little more important than doing an acting job because it's your real life, uh, would you ever use any of these methods in order to make you a better communicator? Would you use this secret weapon method of yours to, you know, go at your landlord? No? In fact, if you brought it up, a person would say, hey, man, this is my life. Quit joking. They would give you a hard time because, in a way, you would have uh, decided that what was going on in their life wasn't important enough, that you weren't taking their life seriously enough. Now, does that seem like an odd way to put things? I don't think so. I mean, look, the bottom line is it makes you more effective. Why would you not use it? It's very simple. Now, I, 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 <laughs> I have to be honest. You know, sometimes uh, people do give me a hard time about it, and they'll say, well, you know, and I'll ask the person what they do, and they'll either be a student or someone who hasn't worked a lot. Now, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. I I'm telling you this because I really haven't met anyone who is very successful who professes to do any of these things. And I've been doing this 35 years. And the day that somebody walks up to me and says, I actually implement those ideas from the middle of the last century, and here are my two Oscars to prove it, I will shake that person's hand and I will say, well, you know what? You're the first person I've met in 35 years in the business. Now go off and turn into 500 or 1,000 and maybe I will start teaching it. But I'm not going to teach a method where maybe one person did it because I haven't met that one person yet. And when somebody does come up to me and say that this is what they do, then I'll say, well, then how successful are you with it? I'm just starting. Okay, well then great. When you're very successful with your career, come back to me and tell me how this stuff works. Anything that has you think of anything other than the thing that's going on in the scene, to me, is absolute nonsense. And I'm speaking to you as a professional who's been on plenty of sets. There's enough going on, man. There's enough hurly-burly on a set. There's enough things to think about. You have marks, you have shadows, you have don't rustle your jacket because it's going to make this mic go crazy. You have all sorts of stuff. We're losing light. We got to get it in the next take. I mean, you know. There's a lot of things that can go on. You don't need to have a lot of acting malarkey in your head as well. You just don't. And I, 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 I firmly believe that.
you know, I normally I do a uh, to prove my point because I've always said that acting is uh, really easy. I mean, you, you, you do it every day. From the moment you get up, you're in some sort of scene all day long until you go to sleep. I mean, this isn't quantum physics. This is like something you do every day. It's not even like an, a sport. It is, it's, you're doing it when you're sitting, when you're talking on the phone, when you're having an argument, you are practicing every day. And when you're sleeping, well, you're practicing an actor sleeping. Very authentically. Pay attention, you might have to recreate that sometime. What would you do differently? Nothing. That's a fact. So then the question is, what do we think about? Well, we think about the things that a person would think about. And I think that if you limit yourself to that, if you get as cleanly to that as possible, you are going to enhance your chances of being that authentic actor you want to be. Why would you think of something extra? Every time you question this, I want you to think about what is that other thing you would do? What is it? And if it's some effective card that you have, why don't you use that card in life? When I'm working with actors, I, don't even, I, I never like them to say, oh, my character this, my character that. I think, you know what, just talk as yourself. Just say me, I. We get it. I know you're not crazy. You're an actor. If you say, um, you know, I'm the serial killer and I'm going to kill her, we're not going to walk away and go, oh, my God, he said I. Somebody called the police. We know. We get it. But actors love to say, well, my character is a fickle little person, and they start talking about this person like they're over there. What, what, why can't it just be you? Why can't you tell me what you would do? Actors worry about creating characters, which I think is such nonsense. You are the sum total of what you say and do. If you start telling me that you're a cop, I think you're a cop. If you say that you went to astronaut school, why wouldn't I believe you? If you say that you just got out of prison, why wouldn't I believe that? I, I watch these real-life shows where they have murderers and things and you know, all sorts of people, and I just watch these people talk. These people never look the way that you think they're supposed to look. They just are people. And what makes them crazy is they start telling you about how they had to kill their sister. And they just tell you about it. You don't sit there and question and say, oh, I don't believe your character. You just think, oh my God. If you say it, we'll believe it. Now, if I said to you and just say yes, are you a cop? I said, please just say yes. Oh, yeah. Did you not hear? <laughs> You're taking direction well, kid. That's brilliant the way you did that. <laughs> yeah, you think I don't know that you're not a cop? <laughs> Are you a cop? Yeah. How long have you been a cop? About five years. Five years. Do you like it? No. All right. <laughs> Beautiful. You got the job. <laughs> you know, you try in life to convince someone that you're something, that's where you start to go wrong, right? Because anytime anyone's trying to convince me of something, I always think, what's wrong with this? I don't try and convince people I'm Jeff. Of course I'm Jeff. Who else would I be? I don't get up every day and think, God, I hope people believe I'm Jeff today. <laughs> what would Jeff do? Jeff would probably do, th no, he wouldn't. He'd probably go like this and go, ha, ha, ha. And I work all these things out. Think about how actors work things out. If you're actors in here, you know what I'm talking about. You go off and you practice your lines. And you try and find a realistic way to say your lines. Is that what you do in real life? Do you do that? Do you get up in the morning and you're on your way to Starbucks and you say, oh, may I have a coffee? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Can I have a coffee? I mean, is that what you do? You try and come up with some cool way to do it with the hope that if you do it, the uh, barista will think, ah, he's a real guy and he asked me for real coffee. I believed him. <laughs> yeah. You know, who would do that? Actors would. And I have to say, why? You know that great actors don't do that, right? You know they don't. No. Great actors do what people do, I think. It's been my observation because I've watched some. You know, in real life, we talk about things we're going to say. You say, you know what, when I see Bob, I'm going to tell him he's not invited on the boat anymore because he gets there, he's drunk, he messes things up, and I'm done with him, and I'm done, and I don't care he's my best friend. And you tell your friend, you, you all have done this, you use your friend as a sounding board, and you say, no, I'm, I'm going to tell the landlord no more just walking in my door. I know my rights. You have to knock, and if I don't answer, you just don't open the door. 
That's against the law, pal. And you go over and your friend says, I definitely do that. That guy's crazy. You go, absolutely, I'm going to tell him that. I'm going there now. Now, when you go there, you don't really think that you're going to put your finger up and your foot forward and do everything the way you practiced it, right? No. What you practiced was an understanding of how you felt. You tried it out with your friend. You said, this is how I feel. Your friend's a sounding board. You're clear emotionally. You're clear intellectually on why you've got a point and why it's correct. But you do not for a moment think about how you will stand or how you will vocalize the line. These are acting concepts. And to think that, well, I'm going to uh, underline all my action verbs. Really? Who does that? I don't even know. If you transcribed what I just said, I, I, I feel like I was in school trying to come up with my action verb. Ugh, I didn't know this was going to happen. You know, and then I'm trying to figure out and who does that? Don't use my car. I mean, you know, you get all these stresses and then you think, oh, I've got to do it that way. And then if you don't, then, I, you know, what is this? This is like puppeteering. That's what I call puppeteering. It's like your self is a puppet and then you're up above yourself and you're making it walk and move your arms and talk and be a certain way. That's not what the great actors do. They don't do that. They get a good idea of what they're saying. They know the lines perfectly. And they get in there and they argue their point in the first person. And it may be a little different from this take to that take, but the gist of what they're doing is always going to be authentic and relevant. And that's the deal. The rest of it is nonsense. It's fake. For me, people say, like, for instance, is there any difference between... Uh, film acting and theater acting. And here's what I say. No, no. What are you talking about? When people say theater acting, they go, well, no, you know, it's a little fakey. And, you know, you got, really? Why? Well, you, you know, you, you have to hit the back wall. Okay, so it has to be a little larger, but can it be large and real? I, I'm definitely large and real most of my life. I'm a loud mouth. I move around. I make sure everybody can hear me. That's large. But does it mean I have to be fake? Why? I would rather lose myself in a story thinking I'm watching life unfolding in front of me. That's how time flies. That's how it flies for me. And wouldn't it be nice if it flew that way all the time when I went to see theater? But generally, people have an idea that when you do theater work, it's presentational and we stand in odd ways and we talk and when I walk past my friend here, I don't turn this way as I'm speaking to him, I turn this way so we can be open to the audience and I, you know, that stuff uh, always looks a little fake to me. Real is real. And I think the more we can streamline an approach that cuts out as much overthinking as possible, the better off you are. I know this, working actors travel light. They got a few things on their mind about what's going on in a scene, and they get in there and they do it in the first person, bang, and they go at you. I can promise you, I've had the pleasure of working with a few of them. And um, it's almost unnerving how present they are when they're speaking to you. You don't feel like there's any acting going on. I've walked off and thought, man, that person takes this stuff seriously. I realize that's the trick. You got to take what's going on in the scene seriously, not acting. That's why in my approach, I don't use any acting terminology. I don't see the need. Why? Why do I want to remind you that you're acting? Yeah, I get it. We are. We're on a set. Of course. I'm not trying to fool you because we can't because ultimately you can't become the character or like Go crazy because we have cameras and they might throw you when you look out and go, why are all these cameras here? So clearly you're the actor, but my idea is how little can we think of acting and how much more can we think about what's really going on in the scene? And so for me, when I speak to actors, when I use this approach, I only want you to know the things a person would know. And I only want you to think about the things a person would think about. I don't believe in the idea, all right, I fill your head full of a bunch of acting stuff and I go, now forget all that and just go act the scene. That to me feels more like a prank, more like I was punking a friend. Right before you go out and film, I'm going to fill your head with a lot of stuff and they go, now don't think about that. 
I only want to talk to actors about the things they need to remember. I don't want you to have to forget things. Why can't we just talk about the things you have to remember? Why can't we just focus on the things a person would? What, you're, you're, you're suddenly not going to be as, as realistically magnificent as you are in life? Because you don't have all these other little acting notions going on? And so then I wonder, how do you get through life? How do you have friends? How, how are you fascinating with all your friends? You, you manage it every day. You jump into situations and you can immediately do it. One of the things that I do is I have a thing I call the gist exercise that I developed because I wanted to give people an idea of how quickly one could argue, uh, one could jump into a situation and be incredibly realistic. And what I do is I, I preface it by saying, if I gave you a page monologue, one page long, and I asked you to look at it, read it through two or three times to yourself, and then in five minutes or less, I'm going to take it away from you. I'm going to ask you to get up in front of a bunch of people you don't know, and I want you to do that monologue verbatim like it happened to you, like this is your story, like there's, there's no anything but reality. This is your story, and verbatim. You would probably think that would be an incredible stunt, wouldn't you? A full page, verbatim, within five minutes, read it through three times, and then get up and perform it. That would seem pretty cool, right? Okay. Now think about this. In real life, how often do your friends tell you incredible stories about their trip abroad, about getting robbed, about the accident they had, and they could be long, not just one page, it could be five pages. You hear it one time, you go off and you repeat it to a friend, and your friend says no, and you go verbatim. Verbatim, that's what he said. And wasn't it verbatim? You don't leave anything out. You don't miss the little side trip to Amsterdam or the guy with the limp. You get it all. You do it all. You do all the little accents and everything. You heard it one time, and you weren't even actively thinking of memorizing it. You weren't thinking, oh, there's going to be a great uh, monologue. I can tell. I'm going to go act that out later with my friend, so I better pay attention. <laughs> You don't. You just let it wash over you, and then you think, that's cool, and you go tell your friend. You'll never guess what happened to Sandy. Blah, 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 blah. You're kidding. Verbatim. That's what she said. If you started thinking about acting or, like, uh, underlining your verbs or coming up with actions for each line, I, I can't even imagine how you get through that. Let me tell you what happens when you do do this. It's amazing... But within a few minutes, most people get 80, 90 percent of the dialogue, like easily. Some people even do better, but most people get at least 80 percent of the dialogue. And because they didn't have time to practice or figure out how they're going to say it or come up with some acting gag they were going to do, their instincts, the instincts that have carried you through your life, that have made you everything you needed to be at the most critical times in your life, that have gotten you through those moments, those same instincts come through, and the performances are always incredible. And it works every time. And in fact, when I go off and do seminars, which in evening seminars, uh, I'm going around the country now because I'm trying to change the course of the way things are being taught, so I realize I probably have to go to 50 cities and do this and then do the demonstrations. Um, it always works. In the beginning, I say people are going to do the best work they've ever done, and it always works. It's never not worked. Now, I may have to coach them a little bit while they're up there, but they always get to the great work, and it has nothing to do with acting thinking. If you are hell-bent on acting thinking, then I just want you to kind of look at it, and I would say to you, how's that working for you? You getting all your jobs? You're working? And if you are, do it. Don't mess with it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But just because it's in a book somewhere doesn't mean that that is the only way. Or just because you think you heard, oh, this guy or that actor did this. Don't do that to yourself. I mean, if people come to study with me and they don't get it, man, move on. But I promise you, if you go and you study somewhere and it's not working for you, Move on. It, 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 should be, it, it should be a thing that inspires you 
my sense is, is that if you read a book and it's about something you're involved in, art-wise, art artistically, you should feel release when you read it. It should be like, ah, not ah, like ah, I don't quite ah. So wherever you find that, that's where you should be. Otherwise, get out. Because I spent time as a kid in classes because I saw other people and I thought, well, everyone must think this works, you know? One of the craziest classes that I ever went to, uh, I, I, I'd seen this guy's book. I was, I was thrilled because it made no sense to me whatsoever. I could not, for the life of me, understand what it was about. But because I was a kid, I thought, that's because I'm the one who's dumb and that I just don't get it, I'm young, and that if I can figure this out, because I think the guy had some lineage, he had knew Stella Adler, you know, some of those names you always hear. I thought, well, you know, this has got to be the real deal. So there were outer spatial objects and wandering objects and bees and knees and all sorts of stuff. And I thought, wow, bees and knees, what is that? How do you do that? Fireball down the back. I thought, oh, okay, so you, you know, fireball, and then you do your scene, and I guess it makes you... Hotter, I don't know, I couldn't. <laughs> so I go to a class and, 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 and it was filled and I was like 19. I thought, wow, this guy's successful, it's packed. And then he did a relaxation exercise, which I think is nonsense. And um, not that people shouldn't relax, but come on, give me a break. What? Is that what you do before your big scenes in life? Listen, if, you, if anything you do before real life situations, then I think it's cool for you to do it. So if before you go and break up with your girl or try and talk her out of breaking up with you or get that raise or any of these other critical moments, if you sit in a chair for 45 minutes to do relaxation exercise and then you go in and you're successful, well, don't mess with it, do it. But if you don't do that in real life, don't do it. Why would you do it? Why are you tense? What, what, I don't even get that. You can call me at 4 in the morning. I pick the phone up. I go, hello. I always sound like I'm awake. Don't call me at 4 in the morning. But that's just how I am. I don't, I don't need to do a tongue twister. I don't do tongue twisters before I go and speak to people. I didn't do a tongue twister tonight. I don't think I've twisted my tongue once. I didn't sit outside going, get, 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 get. I didn't do anything like that. I don't yodel. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I start talking and uh, my voice comes out. I sat there and they were doing this relaxation exercise and this teacher was looking around like a hawk, like a peregrine falcon. He was looking around and then he said, Tim, Tim, it's not a word of a lie. What I'm telling you is the truth. Your left eyebrow's a little tense. <laughs> and I thought, wow. I didn't even look, but I thought, this guy's incredible. I was so, wow. And I looked back. I didn't know who Tim was. It was my first night, but I saw a guy going with his eye trying to get, I thought, well, that must be Tim. He's trying to get that eye down. And after 45 minutes, I mean, I was worn out because I wasn't doing any of this stuff. He said, let's start a scene. So somebody got up with uh, tea and sympathy. That old scene. And the guy said, I'm going to do yellow emanating from my lips, purple emanating from my knees, fireball down the back, burnt arms, broken legs. And no one guffawed. They just said, oh, okay. And I thought, wow, this is like crazy stuff. <laughs> I, I was stunned. I thought, well, how is this going to work? And then the guy did as bad a scene of that that I've ever seen, nothing unusual, no fireball. I thought, well, you have burnt arms, you know, ah, or a fireball. I don't, you know, if you got a fireball just even this far away, I wouldn't feel like doing a scene. I'll be honest with you. I just want to leave. I'd say, I can't be here, man. You got a fireball. But this guy just did a bad scene. I didn't see him once do this or walk with broken legs or I don't know how you even, uh, you know, get yellow to come out. I, 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 and then out of his knees, purple. When it was done, I thought, well, this guy's going to get his head handed to him. And the teacher said, Tim, I felt that the yellow was in and out. Uh, I saw a little of the purple. The fireball wasn't happening. I thought the legs were in and out, and I didn't see any burnt arm. Next time, you know, don't pick quite as many things. And that's when I realized, as a kid, I realized, ah, okay, I get it. So actors just want to believe whatever because we assume we're the dumb one and that acting is something that's like almost mystical and so you got to do like sorcery and that's how you become a great actor. 
And I realized, wow, people will believe anything. In the guise of art, we will believe anything. And that's when I swore off that stuff and I said, all right, man, if it doesn't make perfect sense, if it's not right here, right now, none of this sorcery, I'm not interested in it. I don't know about yellow and purple and all that stuff. And I'm very effective in life and I've never emanated any color that I can think of. <laughs> I've had color, but I don't think I've emanated it. So, I'm starting a revolution. I'm trying to get people to understand that maybe it's time we just start looking at the way we work, what is most effective. And certainly with any actor that I am directing, any actor I'm working with, I only want to hear out of their mouth, what's the problem as I would in life? If you were having an argument with her, I'd say, what's your problem? Why are you angry at her? And I'd want you to talk to me the same way you do in life. You wouldn't say, well, when I was a child, I was whipped and she reminds me of the nanny that did it. You know, that's actor talk. You would tell me, I come home, she's always in a bad mood, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you would be owning something that you felt was justifying your behavior. And I would speak to you and it would be the opposite, the other side of it, of course, because without conflict, we don't have a show. And you would have something that you vehemently believed in. And it, where that meets in the middle is where we have our conflict. And don't you know that if that is all you had on your mind, if you could really just kind of feather that down to that, that's when we have our purest work. That's when you're doing the real thing. Anything extra, any other extra stuff is you being disingenuous. So for me, the 21st century and acting is, let's just think about what's happening in the scene Let's try and put ourselves in our shoes in that scene. Let's own the material as a person would. And let's argue it out as people do. We don't want to be actors. We don't want to look like we're acting. So let's not talk about it. We don't want people to go, oh, he's acting. So let's not act. I mean, we assume things all the time in life and take on different situations. You know, and you are the sum total of everything you do. Maybe you don't drink at all. Maybe you're a teetotaler. You never had a drink. But then you got this big gig. And you go and you have like three beers. And you're out. And they have to carry you out of the bar. Don't you know that if somebody saw you there, they think, God, that kid's got a bad alcohol problem, man. He needs help. <laughs> Why? Because we only met you once, man. And that's what we thought of you. And shouldn't we? So if you go do a gig, instead of worrying about a character, do what the character's supposed to say. Wear the clothes of the character. And that's it. We'll assume you're that thing. You start talking like you don't know how to speak English well, we'll assume you're a guy that hadn't been to school. Why would we assume other? Now pay attention to that. When you go off and you meet people in real life and you listen to some of the crazy things they do, really ask yourself, is there anything other than them telling you that is making them as authentic as they are? I mean, people will play, I'm going to play a, a plumber. I think I'll walk like that because I probably carry pipes all the time. You know, it, it's just nonsense. People thing up and I think, what's with the dumb lamp? What are you doing? I'm doing character work. Are there character people before you ask me, like Daniel Day-Lewis? Yeah, he's like from Mars, man. You want to do Daniel Day-Lewis? Good luck. But what do most mortals do? What I'm telling you. If you are one of those incredible people like Daniel Day who can do the limps and the things and the accents, well, nothing I'm saying is going to change anything you're doing. You're one of those people. You're going to do it. You'll pick up a script and you'll start with some crazy accent and everyone will think it's real. Brilliant. Keep it up. L'chaim. But otherwise, um, uh, I would just stick to being as authentic and as truthful as you can and leave acting. Just forget it. This is my battle cry. This is my mission right now in the United States. I'm hitting all the East Coast cities now, and then I'm going to go back west where I'm from and hit all the West Coast cities and talk to anyone who will listen. Now, do we have any questions? Wow. Um, yeah, so it sounds almost like you don't need rehearsal. Because if you're being real, just do it. Just do the, the lines. And why rehearse? Well, okay, that's a very good question. Why rehearse? You know, I heard a lovely heartwarming story that I think Julia Roberts told about Meryl Streep in um, August Osage uh, County. And she said that, you know, it's amazing is that you imagine Meryl's going to show up and just pop on every cylinder. And to hear her tell it, she said, you know, she was finding her way. 
It's kind of hard to hit a bullseye. We don't know what the bullseye is. And I tell actors all the time, you know, don't, don't, don't be too overly concerned with being right. Actors usually hamstring themselves because they're trying to get things right. All the time they gotta be right in the scene, right, right. And right is a, a crippler. In life, most of us don't put that concern on ourselves to be right all the time. We don't think, oh, I'm going here, I better be right, I better. That would make you kind of a tense, uptight individual that most of us would kind of recognize as a tense, uptight individual. You gotta let it go. Since we're in a situation, it's a play or TV or whatever, a movie, we don't always know, right? So where you're right is, yeah, you don't have to rehearse to be authentic. You should be able to be authentic. People in my classes, like right off the bat, we get to where, you, you know, I, we believe what you're saying. I'm not gonna spend a year with somebody, so then, oh look, a person. No, you came into the room as a person. We're gonna get you there quickly. But what we practice on is getting better at our craft. I've, I say it all the time, acting is easy. Being brilliant, that's, that's, that's where we put our work in. So you may come in and you may have an idea of something and be very authentic, but it may be you know, a little to the left or right of what we're looking for. It may not work quite as well in this scene. I made you to need to do something very different now because of just the way the thing is set up or how we're filming or what the play's about. So yes, there is a need for rehearsal, but with what I'm telling you, uh, we're gonna get, I think, a ton more out of our rehearsals because we're gonna be authentic all the time. Now we're going to just try and find the best way to tell our story and we're going to uh, spend less time trying to get actors to seem real or believable or whatever the case. Does that make sense? And quite honestly, in television, I've worked a lot in television, um, and you know, listen, you hear about it from like Clint Eastwood and these other people, you know, they just like one, two takes. They don't like rehearsals. And, and maybe for a similar reason, because things can get stale Actors will start to do the same thing over and over again, and then pretty soon it'll look like a little bit of a dance routine that's slightly polished, and it doesn't have that kind of unfolding and just freshness of real life. So that's one reason why some people do avoid that is because they're afraid of actors getting that way. But I've worked with actors who are loosey-goosey on every single take. It's a little different. When you're working on stage every evening, it's a little different. You know, it's the same show, but just slightly different. I say, look, there's nothing wrong with it being the same every night. We're the same people, playing the same characters, saying the same lines in the same situation. What it can't be is like tracing paper, where you can lay it perfectly over the other one. You, you know, you may have a story you tell. It's a great story, and you've told it your whole life. You don't, if you're not a liar, you tell the story the same facts every time. You may even use a lot of the same words, but you know, you never think about, oh, I better say it that way and then stand like I did that last time because it was extra fun. You just do it and every time it works. Every time it's right there where it needs to be. You're not thinking about how it's gonna sound or how it's gonna look. You're thinking about what you're talking about. You're thinking about the point you're trying to get across and that's what carries the day. That to me is what great acting is about. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I believe that we are all naturally actors. We write the script, we perform, we show what we believe Beautiful. it is. Uh, so we are natural actors. But I believe, I was thinking when you say, um, I, I don't do this, I do that, is a lot of people are self-confident. And for instance, you exude that. But a lot of actors or, or people in normal life, they might not be as self-confident and they probably want to show most part of us when the younger we are the more we want to show something with the time we learn how to perfect ourselves and act naturally we are more self-confident so if we realize that we are all natural actors we will be more relaxed and but, but now if, if an actor has to represent a role of something that he is not that must be the problem. I'm well, asking you know, when, and, I, and I appreciate that. You know, when I hear that, when something they are not. Well, first of all, um, most people that do sign up for being an actor tend to be slightly gregarious. And, you know, we don't get a lot of social misfits who are socially hampered who then decide they want to be an actor. I mean, generally, it's someone who tells stories. You know, somebody says, yeah, you're funny. You should be an actor. You know, not that there is an exception to that rule, but let's face it. Most people that say, I think I'm going to be a movie star tend to be people who want to be out in the limelight. But 
Let me address this idea about we are going to be people we're not. I get that sometimes. A person says, uh, well, I'm not a murderer. And I say, well, excellent. We need more people like you. But the, the, the point is you're an actor. You've signed up for it. So then all we got to do is say, so what is it that changes you from being a murderer? What, what is the difference? Well, murder. Okay, but we're not going to go murder anyone because, of course, that's bad. So the only difference between you and a murderer is that you haven't murdered anyone. Once having murdered someone, though, what is the difference? Well, the murderer tells a story that actually happened, and you don't have that same story. Okay, so then what is the difference? Just tell me you murdered someone. Why, why can't I believe that? What is it? You know, look, it's, we're actors. You know, one of the, st the stunts I love to pull is this. I say, L look how quickly we could do this. Let's say, okay, you, you brought it up. I'm having a party at my house. As I step out onto the front porch to put the cat out, there's a ton of people inside. You show up. What's your name? Victoria. Victoria. I say, hi, Victoria. I'm glad you're here. Do me a favor. I have a friend here from the West Coast. He's always pulling stunts on me. I love to trick him. Do me a favor. I want you to come in in a minute, and I want you to say, that you just, um, you're shook up and um, you had a husband that was abusing you and before the party he would not let up and he brought out a gun, you turned it around and you shot him and you killed him and you didn't know what to do and you just drove here to the party. I'd say to you, Victoria, I want you to wait one minute then I want you to come in and the guy's gonna have red hair, he's over by the bar. I want you to come in and ask for a drink and just say this happened. And Victoria, if my friend believes you, I'll give you $50,000. I accept. Okay. <laughs> now, Victoria, you see what happened? Is suddenly being something you're not is not so much of a problem, is it? Suddenly, who couldn't take that money? Who couldn't do that? You know what the money does? The money takes away trepidation. That's why I come up with this exercise. It takes away trepidation. I, I have five million. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to pay you. you know, we're just making this up. But the point is... Trepidation means um, uh, that you're scared to do it, that you worry, that I don't think I can. You know, I, I don't know if I can do it. So when I take the money, suddenly what happens? You go, yeah, I'll do it. So really, what is it that stands in our way? What is it? It's just us doing it. It's just saying, I can do this. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do it. Which is really what the actor who's been around a long time gets. You know, people ask me that. What do you gain in all those years? Confidence. That's it. I mean, I know some tricks because I've been on sets. I know how long things are going to take or how certain things work. And, you know, you, you, you know, there's little things. The big thing is confidence. You've been there so many times. You know it's going to work. You memorize more quickly. Things go wrong. You've you got to get it on the next take. The light's about to go out. We're behind. And you've been there so many times that you get confidence. $50,000 can give you confidence. Eliminate that fear of what is the other person going to think about me or to make the ridiculous. For instance, Meryl Streep, she for me is superb. Yeah. Because she's so natural. She doesn't make a lot of. She's shit. fearless. That's she's it. fearless. Do really you know what she's like? She's like a great painter who just takes the paint and with incredible uh, confidence puts it on she's the canvas. That's it. That's what a great artist is. And it translates through all art. It's the ability to be confident in what you're doing, to have an idea and go at it. Any system of acting that asks you to make lots and lots of, I don't like my actors making, you know, oh, write a personal history. I mean, you can do whatever you want. If it works for you, please do it, please. But I think that once you start making lists, you go into the audition and then you wonder if your list was long enough. There'll always be this thing. The, the common thinking is that you've got to do this, 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 and this before you can act. My feeling is you can do it right now, and we'll do this, this, and this, and you're going to even be better. It's play acting. What's the big deal? It's not like I really have to fly if I'm playing Superman. It's like, well, I don't know how to fly. Well, you can't have the job. You know, we, it's make-believe. So what is the hang-up? What is the problem? And haven't by 12 years old, haven't most of us had a lot of experiences? I mean, we've all had tragedies and wonderful things. We've had so many emotions. And if you haven't actually killed someone, well, you know what death is. I mean, you know, if you actually haven't been a pirate, well, you know, you put that on and you have a thing and you have wooden leg and you arg and you just start and you make it work. 
And if you're better at doing this with reckless abandon than the next person, then you're the one that gets the job. But thinking, 35 years of my career as a teacher, I've spent most of my time saying, you're thinking too much, man. You're in your head. You're not present. You're, you're, I'm looking in your eyes, and you're thinking about your next line. You're thinking about what you should be doing. You're thinking about stuff that would make you disingenuous in real life. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is improvisation really that unnecessary? No, improvisation is great. I use it sometimes uh, in class. I'll say, hey, you know, put the scripts down, kind of like the gist exercise, and now let's just kind of do the scene. And maybe we go to the left or right of the scene, but what starts to happen, and this is a big word for me, is ownership. You tend to own what you're talking about. Most actors borrow their words and pretend to own them. The actors, what I try and do is get you to understand, own what you're talking about. Look, you may not know anything about Greenpeace and uh, the whale killing right now. You go home, you watch an incredible thing on uh, this, and by tomorrow morning at a breakfast with a friend, you are going on about how this has got to stop. This is crazy, man. This thing's been outlawed and they keep doing it and blah, 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 blah. You know what happened? You owned your point of view. And when you talk about it at breakfast the next morning, the authenticity in which no one's going to question it. Why? Because you simply decided, you know, that's for me. And so suddenly you own it. The actor, same thing, tomorrow morning's the deal. They're going to practice and they're going to try and say, whales, and say, whales, well, whales. And they're going to try and figure out how to say whales and slam their fist and go like that, which is what a disingenuous person would do. That's, that's like a fool's errand. This, and this is what most acting is, trying to figure out how to seem authentic as opposed to, why don't we just cut out the middleman? Why don't you just decide what you're talking about is important and quit adding all sorts of other stuff to the mix, man? You can't just get behind an idea. You tell me, oh, I killed that person and now I got to make sense of why I did it. You can't do that? You don't sit in judgment of your character when you're an actor, ever. That's not your job. That's the audience's job. Your job is to justify your behavior, just like every single person on this planet does. And they do that because they need to get to sleep at night. So they have plenty of reasons why they do what they do. Some reasons are better than others, but we always come up with them. So you justify what you're doing. You have your point of view. You justify it. You get in there and you argue it like two lawyers in front of the jury, which is the audience. And you argue to win, even if you're the loser. Because in life, we always argue to win. And then at the end, we figure out who the loser is, right? Any other questions? Sorry, one more. Please. Um, the, 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 if you have a script and you don't believe the writing, what you th you've made a judgment that's bad. Yeah, writing. don't do that. <laughs> don't do that, because you know a bad, bad script is being written as I'm speaking. I like 500 probably. Uh, and all languages are being written right now. There's nothing you can do about it. You either take the gig or you don't. But you're dead in the water if you tell yourself, oh, this is crap, this is crap. You can't do that. And besides, I would always tell anyone, when you think you've got a bad script, hey, a lot of times things that are going on in life aren't exactly about what we're saying. We talk about all sorts of things, and I'm actually thinking all sorts of other things. There's that and the fact that you can never do that to yourself. Otherwise, don't take the gig. Otherwise, you're always going to look like you've got something sour in your mouth when you're acting. You can't do that. That's just, forget it. When, I, when an actor comes to me with a bad script that they're going to audition, I ask them, do, do you want to, yeah, definitely. I definitely want to do it. Then I say, okay, look at it this way. Everybody just got that bad script. So if you bring life to it, if you give this some loft, you're going to beat out all those other people who are sitting around going, this is terrible. This is the lousiest script I ever read. And I've also had actors who I thought were quite smart come to me and say, I, I don't even know how to say these lines yet. They're so bad. And I get it, and I look at it, and I say, I would die to play this role. This is brilliantly written, and I've written a little bit. So, again, you know, you, you, you don't know. You do the words perfectly, you breathe life into them, and you don't have that attitude because it'll come through. It'll come through somehow when you're, when you're doing your audition, when you're in front of people. No, you take it. Once you say you're going to do it, then that's it. These are, this is exactly what you wanted to say. Perfect. You know, if you want to be a champion. Yes, sir. Uh, doesn't want your genuine first instinct upon reading the script. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can kill them. <laughs> or uh, you just got to do what they say. Listen, uh, quickly, because uh, I've been the director a lot, um, here's the best thing you can do. 
If you have any real problems, wait. Because there's nothing that we hate more than an actor who's got a lot of opinion. You know what my favorite actor is? <laughs> One who just shuts up. That's my favorite. When I say, do you have any questions? They say, no. My favorite. When I say, is there anything else you need? They say, no. Love them. If you ever wonder what a great actor is, I want you to imagine yourself being a producer or director. And imagine, even in a futuristic Terminator robot kind of actor, what would that actor be? They'd be on time, they wouldn't speak, they'd nail it on the first take, they'd have great manners, and they wouldn't eat too much at the craft service table. <laughs> and then they'd leave like they were never there. Oh, you just want to make out with these people, right? So then down from there are the problematic people, right? So I'm just meeting you. Now, let's say I give you some direction. At first, you say, yeah, Jeff, you know, I kind of saw it a different one. Right off the bat, man, I'm thinking, oh, no, what am I in for? You're not my friend now, but I'm the boss, and I'm going to get exactly what I want. So what's going to happen is I'm going to get it my way anyway. Now, let's say you want to speak to me. You're never going to find me. I know it seems like I'm cutting off my nose to spite my face, but I got enough problems on the set. I don't want to have to deal with a guy who's going to be haranguing me about a bunch of garbage I don't care about. But here's how you get me. Be a perfect soldier right off the bat. Do exactly what I say. When I say, do you have any questions? You go, no, I do not. Then, during lunch, when you walk over and say, can I ask you something? Man, I'm all ears. I'm here for you. What do you need? Why? Because you've proven yourself already as a soldier. You've proven yourself as someone who's not going to get in my way. You've won me over. I'm telling you how to manipulate a director. And that is the only way. But at the end of the day, here's the deal. You got to do what they say. You want it different? Go be a director. People used to tell me about my theater all the time. I had a catchphrase. I'd say, you know what you ought to do? Go get some lumber and build your own theater. Then you can solve that problem you're having. That's how it has to be. They're the boss. And if you let that eat at you, it's like Vince saying, I don't like these lines. If you do the gig, you're in all the way. Or don't do the gig. That's the rule. There's, there's no other way. It's show business, man. Unless you become Marlon Brando. And then I guess you can sit around and do whatever you want. And say, I don't know, stupid. And you can just yell at people and they will follow you. And go, Marlon, please, stop eating. So, you see what I mean? That's how it works. That's how it works. All right? Actors tend to be so, you know, about themselves. We see them coming. I can see it in their face when they're walking toward me. Jeff, and I think, oh, yeah, tell, I, I got to go to the bathroom. Just tell them not to me. You know? And I just go hang around the corner somewhere. I'm sorry, number two. Um, so that's how it works, man, right? Be good, be a soldier, be respectful, great manners, don't speak too much. It's like an audition, my favorite audition in the world. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. Do you have any questions? No. Are you ready? Yes. Then you crush it, and then you say, thank you very much, folks, and you walk out of the room. That's the Lone Ranger. That's like a rock star. Not the actor who sits there, oh, can I do it again? Oh, please, sir, a little more. You know, we're not looking for restoration projects. This isn't a soup kitchen. We need professional professionals who come in and nail it, like on, so you think you can dance. They get one shot. And sometimes they have to stop halfway through, right? They don't get to do it and they go, oh, what, my shoes are new. Can I do it again? No, you cannot. We're looking for pros. So you come in, you're quiet, you nail it, you leave. And the faster you leave, the sexier you are. Because we think, wow, he doesn't need us. Maybe we need him. Never rude, though. Never arrogant, because I can't stand that stuff. Just kind. Thank you very much, folks. And you're out. And I mean, I make people leave quick. And they tell me afterwards, I left so quick, Jeff, you would have been proud. Because I've sat in those rooms, and I know what it's like to try and see 80 people in a day. You get people standing there. Oh, so um, I wanted to ask you, will I really be riding a bike? Because I don't know how to ride a bike. You know, it's like, just <laughs> shut up. Get out. Any other questions? No? Have we answered every single question possible no, in this? You say no. You say you love the West. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Very good. Victoria, you're going to go far. Yes. Um, so I, I directed two music videos. Where, you know, Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a big and, thing to direct anything. I, you know, I would like to direct some shorts and other things. Beautiful. Um, during the second music video, I had an actress be emotional, and I tried to deal with it the best I could, but I've never received any advice on how to deal with a actress' emotions. What do you mean emotional? Like she was upset? Uh, just or like she, some, just some, let, let's just say some random thing. And know, she just uh, went overboard yeah, and went crazy. Yeah, went overboard crying. And I was, 
Okay, what here's, do you, what would you do? here's what I do. Yeah. It never matters who's right or who's wrong. You want to win. I don't care about who's right or wrong. When I'm working, I don't care. Because, listen, I need to get through my shoot. So even if they did something really bad, it's not about me taking them to school and reprimanding them and proving that she's right and you're wrong. And Man, I'm thinking, how can I put this fire out and get this girl off my set with as least little damage as possible? Now, is that manipulative? Uh, yes. Am I using her in a way? Uh, more than likely. But she drew first blood because she acted unprofessionally. Now, that doesn't mean that I start acting unprofessionally. That means I go over, what can I do for you? How can I make this work for you? And then I make them understand, but we have to continue shooting. Most actors, you know, and God bless them all, they're so insecure, man. I mean, it's really a hard thing to do. It's really, really hard stuff. That's why I think that anyone who teaches, anyone who does anything, uh, should have done some of these things. You should actually be out there auditioning all the time. You should actually have acted a little bit or directed some actual stuff or tried to make a living from it as opposed to just teaching because this kind of stuff you don't learn unless you've, you've had it happen. So actors are insecure and sometimes they fly sideways. It's a weird business and it's a weird job to have. It's really hard. There is no other business in the world where the highs are so high and the lows are so low. You know, a plumber has a good week and then a bad week. Good week and then a bad week. An actor has a series and then nobody wants to talk to them. You don't know what that's like, man. You don't know what it's like to be on red carpets and to have stuff happen and then it just go away. It is very weird. And so they turn to whatever they turn to. So I have a lot of heart for these people. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who's right and wrong. It doesn't matter. You don't need to teach these people. You may never see these people again. All that matters is that you get your project done. So whatever you need to do to comfort them without selling the farm or killing someone for them, just make it right. Don't worry about it. Because sometimes you want to go up and just choke them, choke them out. Just get them and just watch their eyes go back and just drop them. And then say, next. But you can't. Because this would be against the law and there isn't anyone else. So you can't do that. You just make it work. And don't ever worry about it. I'm, I'm going to keep saying it. Because we get caught up in who's right and wrong. Or how out there she Forget it. You're here now. What are you going to do about it? Take her back to school? Retrain her? You, you got, you're losing the sun. Fix it. Fix it. And then be very gracious. Say thank you very much for being here. No, no bad blood. It's never worth it. It's never, you know, not even go to the trailer and, by the way, I hated your guts the whole time. You know, it doesn't matter. What matters is your product. That's it. Okay? Don't work with them ever again. But, you know, keep stuff clean, simple, and nice. Just put fires out and get back to work. That's all that matters. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. In an um, audition, I have a question. Please. Based on the few experience that I have. When you see an actor in an audition, when we go to audition, uh -huh. what we deliver or what we see is just as good as it gets. What do you mean? When you I mean it's like if I have some actors in an audition and I see them, most of the time, based on my experience, I think of what I really see, and then based on that, and someone doing the play or doing the... Uh, they make it better? They, they just they. get a little bit better yeah, than that. Yeah. Not that much. Okay, well, here's so the deal. So say, what you see there... No, not always. Right. And you get better at it. I promise you, when you've watched 10,000 auditions, you can get really good at it, because I've seen every single of that. Sometimes the actor comes in and gives you audition, and that's the best thing they do. They don't get any better. In fact, they get worse. Sometimes I see someone, and they're really pretty good, and then they get really great. It all depends on the person, and you just get better at picking that person. But I think you'd be best to always go with the idea that that's probably about as good as it's going to be. You certainly don't hire people saying, I hope they get 50% better. <laughs> You know, you, you can't, then you, you know. You have to accept the fact that what you're watching is gonna probably be about what you're gonna get, but with a costume and better lighting and you know, with a little, a little slicker. But if you start betting that they're gonna be better, then you know, then you're in trouble. You're in big trouble, right? Anything else? Yes, please, yeah. <clears throat> I hate to go back to this, but you know, if you have like a David David Mamet or a 
Aaron Sorkin, who uh -huh. are recognized as great writers. But right. Then, you know, people, is bad writing just not real or fake or is it a lie? And how can they, how can they? Listen, I've heard, I, if it's no, he, here's what I know. I've <laughs> seen lousy writing brilliantly delivered. In fact, every so often, if you can be conscious enough, actually see the words of a great actor on a page sometime, and you'll realize that what they just said was just yeah. nothing. And man, they were excellent. And then you can see brilliant writing, lousy, because the actor just couldn't give it anything. So I think at the end of the day, a great actor can make almost anything work. That's just how it is. Go ahead. Nowadays, directors don't know how to talk to actors, especially casting yeah. directors. So how do you do yeah. it usually when you're in an audition? And casting directors yeah. take you away from being yeah. realistic, but you know they brought you in and you want to yeah. be professional. Because I have Okay, that two things. Have. Two things. One is I'm writing a book called uh, Directing Talent. So it's actually going to address the way that uh, I think that uh, directors need to talk to actors and also how casting needs to talk to actors. This is kind of like uh, the problem with uh, medical professionals. They've spent so much time in school that you hear about a lot of doctors that have bad bedside manners because they haven't socially been active. They've just been this kid who was 18 and now they're like 32 and they're a man and now they've got to deal with some pretty tough stuff if they're a doctor. To that same end, I thought, I really need to write some because most directors have no idea how to talk to someone and they can just get you off on the wrong foot. So, but in answering your question specifically, it's the same answer with the director giving you bad stuff. You have to take what the casting director is giving you and try and make that work in something that feels authentic for you, as authentic as you can. But at the end of the day, man, you know, you, you never know what they're going to tell you. And you can't say, hey, that's stupid, unless you're Marlon Brando. Then you say, that's stupid. <laughs> and then I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and walk out, and they'll come after you. But you, you got to do what they say. You can't let it bother you, though. You have to expect it. Actors get so caught up. I was ready to go, and then she said that, and it just, it's her fault. Well, yeah, okay. But I guarantee you that the champion listens to it and makes it work. I, I, you know, I can probably count on one hand or maybe two in my career the brilliant directors I worked with who said cool stuff. And I've worked with a lot of directors. You just don't count on it. What most professionals will tell you is, I just hope the director doesn't say something stupid to me. That's what I've heard a lot of professionals say. If they can get through a movie and the director doesn't do something to just throw them off course, they're happy. The idea that I'm going to go, hey, you're going to go, wow. That is like, that, that's like amazing. So you're going to get a lot of that because their mind is in a different field, man. They're not necessarily brilliant communicators with actors. They got like a gagillion things going on. They're the general and they got all sorts of people. And they think they've hired you to just do your job. However they say what they say, your job is to synthesize that into something that's going to be the answer to their question. So they're putting that on you. But I'm still going to write the book because I think they could use some help. So, yeah. Anything else? Well, listen. This has been one of the pleasures of my life. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate this. And Steve, thank you so much uh, for allowing this. And what a cool thing. And anyone out there in the world that's watching, thank you. Is that it? Now what do I do, Steve? <laughs>Thank you, Jeff, for being here. <laughs> I know who needs a class. Can I, can I do it again? Can yeah, I start right. again? <laughs> that was great. Can we get another round of applause, please? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. For those watching online, don't forget, we have the books for sale. You can give us a call. We'll get one signed for you. Jeff will be sitting right here. For those of you here, you're required to buy five copies apiece. Aha! Right here. Thank you so much for coming. Good night. Thanks.